Hello, I'm Elizabeth Pompey with DAV, and you're about to watch an interview with Rafael Sierra, a DAV benefits advocate and Army combat veteran. Rafael enlisted in 1993 as a combat medic, served in Iraq and Afghanistan, and retired in 2018. In this interview, Rafael shares his journey from growing up in Panama City, Panama, to serving in the most elite military in the world and becoming an American citizen. Enjoy. So I was born in Panama City, Panama, in, in, to be more specific, in an area called Río Abajo, Parque Lefebvre, Calle Quinta, and um, Loma Morgan. So uh, those are different places, like Parque Lefebvre is uh, sort of the city, Río Abajo is sort of like the neighborhood, Calle Quinta would mean Fifth Street, and then um, at the end of Fifth Street, it's, it was this long hill, and, and it, used, it used to be called Loma Morgan. And that's where I lived. <laughs> um, it was wonderful. Growing up in Panama was so simple. Things were what I would consider to be the good old days, you know. Um, just to, I mean, I was young. And just to put it in perspective, I, I would go to school. I would get home, hang up my uniform. And then all I had to do, just put on some shorts and run out the door. No shoes no shirt, nothing else. And no one would have to, you know, even bat an eye on it. You know, it was just, it was normal. Nobody, kids didn't wear shoes and shirts, you know? And so, but it was so simple. Everyone in my neighborhood knew each other. All the parents were like, could have been your aunts or uncles, you know? And, and it was great. I really enjoyed living in Panama. I, I had a lot of friends in my neighborhood and there is no worries. <laughs> so how old were you when you left Panama? Um, and what was that like for you, especially because it sounds like you really loved your community and your home. So what was that like for you? Devastating. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't get over it uh, for like the past. I mean, for the first four years and so, I just kept thinking one day we're going to go back to Panama. You know, it was sort of abrupt, abruptly. Um, my parents divorced. And in search of a better future, my mom decided to just leave everything behind and move to the U.S. So we literally sold everything that we could um, and bought suitcases, a suitcase for each person of the family. So my brother, sister, uh, mom and I each had a, a suitcase and moved to the U.S. Um, to go to school. So when and, and why did you start to consider serving in the military? How did that happen? Well, when I was in high school, I was part of um, a program. It was called Future Leaders of America. And what that was is you would go to school uh, for half a day and you would knock out all your core classes. And then, and so then after lunch, you would actually go to work. You, you, you have a job that was, um, that would, you know, collect all your hours. Uh, they would have to fill out a, like a, a weekly report that you take back to your counselor at school. And, and that was in preparation for you to become, you know, a future leader in America. <laughs> and so my high school year, I would, I was never part of a, you know, like an after school team or anything like that. I was just always working to help uh, provide for the rest of the family. So my, my mom worked, my brother worked, my sister, we all worked um, to make ends meet in Miami, pay the bills. And so, um, so that was one of my main things. I always, I always wanted to provide and help provide for the family. Like I said, I, I grew older and I started understanding that we were gonna stay in the US and this, this was our new beginning. And so I wanted a new beginning. And I thought if I joined the military, I could learn a skill that I could use towards that, you know, whatever the future was going to be. And 
And if I didn't like it, at least I had a skill that I could do and, you know, continue to do whatever that was. And so when I, when I joined the military, so my recruiter offered me to be a medic. And, and I remember going back to my mom and asking, you know, what do you think about, you know, being a, a, a medic, you know, an EMT? And she thought, hey, you know, that'd be great if you don't like it. You could get out and you could continue as an EMT, perhaps a paramedic one day. So that was the plan. And if you stayed in the military for, um, I think it was seven or eight years, then you would automatically would become a, a resident. I mean, a citizen. And so when you joined the military, um, I mean, how much was that part of the equation? The idea that you could get citizenship through your service? It, it, was, it was definitely part of the equation because I knew that a lot of people were not getting that opportunity. Um, I knew that, I mean, you'd see it on like on TV and, you know, a lot of people were being deported and, and having to go back to the country that they came from and... And so I knew that this is a, a big deal. And, and it was almost like a win-win situation. You know, not only do I get a skill that I learned, and, and by the way, you get, you know, a, a room board, you get meals, you get, I mean, and then you get the recognition of being in the most elite military in the world, you know? I mean, it it was just like, why wouldn't, why wouldn't I? Um, and then I, I, I knew also that my mom would be very proud, you know, to be able to see me um, as, a, as an American soldier and, and see her, her dreams be realized, you know, of a better, you know, future for, for her family and for my family in the future, you know. Soon after my AIT, um, I got orders to go to Germany. And, and that was really different. Germany was not, and Germany in the military was just, it was just great. It was just a blast. Like my unit that I, um, that I, I was assigned to was the uh, um, 126 Infantry out of Schweinfurt, Germany. And it was, a, it was an infantry unit and we had a medical platoon and I, I'll never forget, uh, the day we arrived, the whole medical platoon came to pick me up at the bus station. And it was just a whole bunch of medics. I think it was like 30, 33 medics. They came to just like round me up, like we got a new medic. And, and they just got all my bags and we, we went to the barracks and everybody was just like there waiting with drinks in hand and it was a Friday night that I arrived too. So it was, <laughs> yeah, it, the, the camaraderie of the medical platoon was just awesome. Uh, it was just great. It was just like, I just made a whole bunch of brothers and, and we would train hard, work hard and we would play hard. And it was always, um, you know, there was never like a time where I, I was by myself. There was always few other medics or, or even few other infantry or just other soldiers that, that, you know, you connect with. And, and that set the motion for me to stay in the army for 24 years. Cause it was always like that, you know, it, everywhere you went, you connect with, with, you know, with your staff, with your other MOSs. And there is never, a, a, you know, you never felt alone you, you never felt lonely I just um and if and if it wasn't you would make it that way and it's so I went from one enlistment to two enlistments to and it just kept going every every enlistment I just like oh no I could do this four more you know and and then eventually I met my wife um and we we got um, sent to Iraq together, and in Iraq, 
I it's where I met my 10 year mark. And I, I came up for reenlistment. And after the 10 year mark, when you reenlist, you reenlist for an indefinite. It was that was a big deal because now you know that hey, there's no going back, you know. And so, but I was fine. Um, I knew that I wanted to keep doing it, and I knew that um, it'd only be a matter of time till I hit 20 years. What was your time in Iraq like? Iraq, oof. there's there's different there's different feelings about Iraq. Yeah. Um, I was lucky. I was lucky for several reasons. One that my first, so my first duty station, it was the, that infantry unit I spoke about. We we were deployed to Macedonia. We were deployed to Bosnia. Uh, later, with um, my second unit in Germany, we were deployed to Kosovo, and so those were all. Although they they were not combat uh, environment. There were UN, there were peacekeeping missions, but everything was still very much the same. You know, you were still at a, you know, heightened alert status, right? So, you know, you, you're just not strolling around town in civilian clothes, you know, you're still in full uniform, you still have a full load um, of rounds. And so that helped me as a medic prepare to like how to be ready, what to expect. And even some of the some of the injuries that could happen. And so when I went into Iraq, I already had a good idea of what to expect. Um, I mean, I wasn't ready for motor attacks every day, you know, two or three times a day. But mentally uh, and physically, I already knew what sort of what to expect. And 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 not to mention. I was there with Danielle. Danielle was a nurse and I was a medic. We were in the same unit, the 67th Combat Support Hospital. And so at the end of the day, I had somebody to talk to. I had somebody to, you know, convey with. And, and I, I didn't feel the stress that other uh, soldiers were feeling, you know. If they were a parent, they had their their kids back home or their spouse back home. And, and they were constantly thinking about that. And so at least I knew that, you know, my better half was right in the same area that I was. Right. And that was easier for me. So that's what I meant about, um, you know, being, being a lucky person in Iraq. You know, hear from some... Uh, service members and veterans, you know, they might feel this kind of patriotic sense of duty to serve their country, give back to their country. Did you feel that? And, and, and if so, kind of given that you were a resident and not yet a citizen, what did that, I guess, feel like for you? In, in very ma many ways, um, I felt like the, the U.S. had provided for me and and I still feel the same way. Like I do what I do now as a DAV national service officer because I feel like I want to continue to give back um, to the veterans. Nowadays, so nowadays is to the veterans. When I was in the army, it was I was there to assist and provide, you know, for that for that combat soldier and, and there's dependent. Um, but then when I transitioned, I, that was like my way of life and it, it, it just changed and I wasn't prepared to stop it. And so I feel now that I'm working for the DAV as an NSO national service officer, I could still give back to the veterans, help them with their disability compensation claims with any VA benefits because it's a complicated world. The VA benefits side of the house, it's very complicated. And a lot of veterans don't understand it. I've been lucky that I understand um, several aspects of it. I understand the, the medical injury part of it. And I'm able to put those together. 
and being that I've been there and, and done it myself, um, I can truly relate and be compassionate and, and put myself in their shoes and just go that extra mile to try to help the veteran out in figuring out their benefits and, and what they need. And not just for them, but for their dependents and for the surviving spouses as well, right? So, and I hope that one day someone will do the same for, for my spouse when I pass, so. So at, at what point did you apply for citizenship or how did that whole process work? That came about automatically. Yeah. I mean, one day I received a letter in the mail, it's like exactly about eight years out. <laughs> And it, you know, it, it, it had all the, the, uh, the, what do you call it? U.S. U.S. Um, stamps. You know, I was, um, what was that? I was stationed in, in Fort Meade, Maryland. And I received a letter and it said, Hey, you have an appointment, you know, to show up this day at this time for your, for your, you know, racing out the right hand. And so, but I, I didn't, I didn't have to submit any paperwork or anything. It just, the letter showed up oh. and I'm assuming it was just because, you know, I was in the military and it was part of the program or part of the, the, the signing up deal. So we're used to such like convoluted bureaucratic processes that it's nice for something to be so automated and actually right. work. <laughs> that's what I was thinking you know people used to say they wait years and they tried and tried and and you know they would never you know and one day and that's why I think it was just because I was a, still in the military it was easier for them to just process and say okay this individual you know he's serving here send them the letter and let's get him in here and get it done and so um it it, it was uh just a great moment. I, I, I attended the ceremony and I didn't know what to expect. And there was tons of people there. And you go into this big room, um, you raise your hand, you swear in, and, and then that's it. They, you get the certificate at the house. Um, I immediately sent it to my mom and she was super excited and happy and proud of me. And, and that's how just things turned out. Um, it was it was another moment where you know you you make your your parent proud of you and help realize her dream you know that she knew that we'd be better off you know in the united states of america you know, with all our liberties and our freedoms and and our way of life and so yeah it was it was great it was but truly, I was truly honored to be able to, to do that. If you can put yourself back in uh, your 12-year-old self, uh, <laughs> you've just arrived in Miami. You're not happy about it. <laughs> do you think you ever could have imagined what your life here would, what would have been like? No, not, not at all. My, you know, I, I, I share this with some some not too many people, but my dreams, my dream growing up in Panama was I wanted to be a bus driver and nothing, nothing wrong with being a bus driver, but that was like my ultimate dream. That's, that's like what I could imagine myself doing for the rest of my life. And it was just being a bus driver and never in my life would I ever imagine that, you know, one that I would live in the U S to um, serve in the most elite military in the entire world. Three, meet so many different people, uh, experience so many cultures, do everything or so much that I've done, and marry an American, you know, an American person. Um, you know, green, you know, green eyes, blonde hair, never, you know. And, when you're growing up in Panama, you don't even think about that, you know, that was never, and then being able to accomplish so much, um, my, both my kids were born in the U.S., their first generation, um, we, we live in a nice neighborhood, you know, 
have a nice house and live in the American dream. It's just, I, I don't know. I could, I could have never imagined. I, when I was 12 years old, I could have never, ever thought that I'd be where I'm at today. 